morning, everyone. I'm Meredith Dancos. I'm the lead pastor here at The Well. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome. Uh, we are so glad that you're here. If you're watching us online or on the app, be sure to fill out our digital connect card and let us know that you joined us and how we can be praying for you. If you're here in person, you can download the app if you don't have it, or if you already have it, you can pull out your phone, fill out the digital connect card, and also let us know how we can be praying for you. Our staff prays every Tuesday morning to start off our staff meeting for all the prayer requests that come in. So we are glad to hear what is going on in your lives and, and really uh, look forward to praying for you. So we are continuing our series called Reality Check as we're looking at the book of James. And as we've said each week, James is a really challenging book because his whole premise is you can't just say that you're a person of faith. You can't just say you're a follower of Jesus. It's got to look like something. It's got to show up in your life. And today we're talking about humility, real humility. And what does that look like? And the truth is, we only actually often see false humility. And false humility is when we try to talk down about ourselves, or we know like we might be good at something, but we're like, oh, no, 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 no. It's not me. It's all God, or thanks. But, you know, we want, we want to seem like it's not so good. And one of the ways that we can try to look humble, but maybe we are not, is the humble brag. Anyone ever experience the humble brag? I mean, you know what it's like when someone is trying to be like, I'm trying to tell you that I'm awesome, but I'm also trying to not look like I think that I'm awesome. And so some of the ways that humble brag show up, one is like the complaint, you know, where you're complaining about things like, oh, I hate that I look so young and I get carded all the time. Or, you know, I hate that I've lost so much weight and my clothes don't fit anymore. Whatever that is, and you're trying to be like, you know, I'm telling you that something's great about me, but I'm just complaining about it, really. Or there's the modesty one, like, oh, why do I always get asked to work on the best projects at work, you know? Or why, why does everybody always invite me to their birthday party or whatever that is? And you're like trying to be awesome but modest at the same time. So social scientists have been studying the effects of the humble brag. And what they have found is that people actually like you better if you just are an outright braggart, right? If you are just boasting and say how great you are, or if you are a complainer, like you just are literally an Eeyore and you're whining, they prefer that to the humble brag. Why? Because the humble brag is insincere. People can see through it. They see the brag and they see the attempt to hide the brag. And so when we humble brag, when we think that that's a way to express humility, it's actually counterproductive because people like you less and trust you less. So that's not really working for us. So we need to figure out what is real humility. What does that really look like? Because real humility isn't, as we're going to see, having a low opinion of ourselves, thinking less of ourselves, that we're, that we're worse than we really are. Real humility is grounded in Jesus and who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for us. And so James, he gives us this picture of what humility could look like. And in chapter 1, he says this, Believers who are poor have something to boast about, for God has honored them. And those who are rich should boast that God has humbled them. They will fade away like a little flower in a field. The hot sun rises and the grass withers. The little flower droops and falls and its beauty fades away. In the same way, the rich will fade away with all of their achievements. And this is what's known as the great reversal in James. And we also see it show up in Jesus' teaching. So he's echoing the teachings of Jesus. In this great reversal, James says, those of you who are poor, those of you who are in lower circumstances, you should boast. And that word boast can mean, in, this, in a negative way, it can mean an inappropriate expression of pride, or an inflated sense of righteousness, you know, in a negative sense, but it can also mean to glory in something. And the way that James is using this word is to glory in this. So he's saying, those of you in lower circumstances, you should glory in your exalted position. And those of you who have higher status in the, in the sense of the world, who are rich and wealthy, you should also glory, you should also boast in your humbled status. And it's this great reversal that both should boast, but not because of the ways of the world. And so one should boast because of their low estate, even though in the, in the ways of the world they seem to be high. And the other one should boast because they have been exalted by Jesus. And we begin to see the root of true humility. Where it starts is in perspective, in right perspective, in essentially in eternal perspective, to see the world and our place in it, not through the, the eyes 
of worldly status, but through the kingdom of God. And part of the reason why those who are in lower status can boast, can glory because of their exalted status is they are reminded of the reality that when the kingdom of God comes in full, everyone will partake in it. Everyone will share in it. Jesus, in this great reversal, he says, and, and note this, some who seem least important now will be greatest then, and some who are greatest now will be least important then. Saying that though you think that you are high in, in, in the ways of the kingdom, you will be brought low, and those who feel like they are low, they will be brought high. He also says in Luke, God blesses you who are poor, for the kingdom of God is yours. God blesses you who are hungry now, for you will be satisfied. God blesses you who weep now, for in due time you will laugh. And so what James is echoing from the teachings of Jesus is root yourself in the reality of the kingdom of God. That's where we find our sense of worth and being. And he goes on to say, the rich may seem powerful now, but they're going to fade away like the grass. They're going to wither like this little flower. You know, James does not mince words. He just says it right out there. Your wealth, it's not going to last. It's not permanent. It's not the thing to bank on. And Jesus, he gives a warning about this. He says, what sorrow awaits you who are rich, for you have your, you have your only happiness now. What sorrow awaits you who are fat and prosperous now for a time of awful hunger awaits you. What sorrow awaits for you who laugh now for your laughing will turn to mourning and sorrow. And Jesus is not just saying, if you have worldly wealth, if you're rich, well, woe is you. Yours is coming your way. No, what he's talking about is those who invest their worth, their sense of self, their sense of value in worldly riches. Because he's saying, this is going to end. It's all temporary. It's going to go the way of the ghost. And you will be sad because you will be left empty. You will be left with nothing. And so he's saying, don't put your, your, your sense of self into that. And so both, both are called to see the meaninglessness of worldly wealth and status in light of the kingdom of God. That these don't, these don't hold a candle to it. And so humility is all about perspective. It's all about perspective. It's about thinking about ourselves in a right way in light of who God is. It's not a low opinion of ourselves. C.S. Lewis says this, humility is not thinking less of yourself, it is thinking of yourself less. So it's not trying to have a lower opinion of yourself. It's that when our perspective gets right, when we put God in the center of our lives, suddenly we're not so self-consumed with what other people think about us and impressing others and getting the status and the things that the world says are worth getting. In fact, he goes on to say that false humility, you know, when we're trying to think less of ourselves, he says this, by this method, method, thousands of humans have been brought to think that humility means pretty women trying to believe they are ugly and clever men trying to believe they are fools. And what he's saying is, really, if we think that humility is trying to have a lower opinion of ourselves, the truth is you're still prideful. You're still valuing yourself in the ways of the world. Now you're just trying to hide it. Now you're trying to downplay it, but you still think those are the most important things. And when we come to real humility, that begins to shift. Again, humility is not a low opinion of yourself. It is a right perspective of yourself. When Jesus is at the center, we experience true humility. David Wilkerson says, a humble person is not one who thinks, of, thinks little of himself, hangs his head and says, I'm nothing. Rather, he is one who depends wholly on the Lord for everything, every circumstance. And so real humility is grounded in our relationship with God, is grounded in that reality that everything we have, we are dependent on God for. Life itself, breath itself. You know, Deuteronomy says the fact that you can even work is a gift from God. And when we lose that perspective, that's when pride sets in and things get all out of whack. And James says <laughs> the root of all of this is allegiance. It's loyalty. It's what are you aligned with? And he goes on to say, you adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. Do you think the scriptures have no meaning? They say that God is passionate, that the spirit he has placed within us should be faithful 
to him. And he gives grace generously. As the scriptures say, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And he likens this to adultery, saying it's so unfaithful. Friendship with the world. And we think, you know, friendship is like liking something, you know, being fond of it. But for, in this context, the context that James is writing in, friendship is more than that. It's, it's an identity with another person. It's a fidelity, a commitment, often a lifelong commitment. And it's saying that what you value and your expectations are also my values and expectations. We are aligned. And so what James is saying is when you align yourself, when you are friends with the world and the ways of the world, when your fidelity and your commitment is with the ways of the world, you are in opposition to God. You are naturally hostile to the things that God is passionate about, the things that God cares about. They don't go together. And so then God opposes you in the way that you're living, in the way that you're choosing, because you're choosing against his kingdom. And so what he's saying is you become proud. And that word proud, it means to have uh, an exaggerated opinion of yourself, to be arrogant, but it leads to disdain and scorn of others. And so we begin to see ourselves very highly, and we start to look down on other people, and that leads to division and discord. And that's what James is getting at in this letter, because there's all this division happening in this community. <laughs> and so he says to them, what is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight and wage war to take it away from them. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you ask God, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. This community has lost right perspective. And now pride has set in and we see scorn and division. We see that they have become friends with the world and they are now in opposition with God. And James shows four signs that show up when we are aligned with the ways of the world. And the first one of those is jealousy. Jealousy. And this is that I start looking around and seeing what other people have. And I start to believe that I am entitled to what other people have. So if you have a car that I want, I should have that same car. If you have that type of job, I should have that same type of job. If you have that type of paycheck, I should, or house, or spouse, or kids, or whatever it is, we look around and we think, I should also have that. I am entitled to the things that I want. And James says, these are evil desires that are driving you. The word there, the root of that is the same root of hedonism. So these passions, these lusts that are not in line with God's heart are driving your attitude of heart. And you begin to look around and you think that somehow you are missing out. And so we have a wrong perspective when we find ourselves jealous of others, when we begin to feel like God is withholding from us and that others are competition. And that leads to the next one, which is fighting. And James, he says, they're scheming and killing and fighting and waging war. James probably picked up from his brother hyperbole because there's no like real evidence that this, that this church is actually waging war with one another or killing one another. But what he's saying is when you get so centered on yourself and you allow entitlement and jealousy to take hold, you begin to see someone else's gain as your loss and you start to wish harm on them. One way or another, whether it's physical harm you know, or it's relational harm or reputational harm, we want to see them lowered because we believe that it's a zero sum game. If you're winning, I'm losing. That means in order for me to win, you have to lose. And we start to see what others to, to be knocked down. And some of the ways that we see karm is just by being stingy and withholding ourselves, by not sharing what we could share, because that might benefit them. And if that benefits them, then that hurts me. And so we start to compete with one another, which then leads to self-dependence, this third mark that we become friends with the world, because it means that I begin to rely on me, that security comes from whatever I can secure for myself, whatever I can provide for myself. And he says, you don't have because you don't ask God. And we stop relying on God because we begin to believe that I am self-reliant. And we can do that with all sorts of things, your bank account, your retirement account, your housing, your status. And you begin to think that this is the most important thing. And so we protect it. 
which then leads us to selfishness, to selfishness. Me thinking about me for my sake. And he says, even if you ask God for it, you don't get it because you're not asking with the right heart. Your intention is only to benefit yourself for what pleases you and what benefits you. And so we begin to ask with selfish gain in mind. We begin to think that God exists to make me happy and give me what I want. God exists in order for my bank account to be the number that I want it to be at, for, the house to, for me to own the house I want and have the job I want and have the spouse I want and the same number of kids that I want. And whatever it is that I want, that is God's purpose. God exists to please me. And God becomes this genie or ATM in the sky. That we, that we lose our perspective. We lose perspective of what it means to be in relationship with God, what God wants for us. And these are all signs that we've chosen friendship with the world, that we've aligned ourselves, that our loyalty is to the ways of the world. And we have to step back and remember, James is writing to a group of Christians, of Jesus followers, these are people who have already accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. They are a community that are united around Jesus. And he is saying, your perspective is off. And we have to ask, why is it so hard to choose God over the world? Why is it so hard? Because we know, all of you who are already Jesus followers, you know God should be your number one love, right? You know that God should be your first priority and you should rely on him for all things. Do you? I don't. I definitely don't. They're, I mean, I wake up anxious all the time thinking, I need to do this, and I got to do this, and what if this person thinks this? Right? We are so quick to align ourselves with the ways of the world and what the world offers and the status and the security that the world offers over and over again. We can know the right things, but what we live is different. And Jan Meyer says, one of the reasons why it's so hard to trust God is because we are afraid that God is the God of our worst fears. God of our worst fear. She says this, when I see God as the God of my worst fear, I assume he only has requirements of me and will leave me completely alone to get the job done. Often when I hear Jesus calling, I hear only my worst fear, asking for too much and wanting to be appeased with burdensome, lonely labor. And if we're honest, part of the reasons why we struggle to trust God first over anything else is because God is unpredictable and sometimes God feels disappointing. The thing that I wanted, the thing that I was hoping for, didn't come about. And so we begin to believe that God is the God of our worst fear. And she says this, worst fears take many forms. God will not remember me. God will shame me for what I've been involved in. God will get my hopes up and then dash them. God will ask too much of me. God will leave me alone. And so we align ourselves with the world really because it offers us this allure, this illusion of control, that you can control how much you invest in something, how much you give to something, how hurt you will get. You know, because God, he might ask for too much. He might ask me to sacrifice something I don't want to sacrifice. He might ask me to value something I don't want to value. I don't know if I believe that living life God's way is a good way to live. It feels like that's just going to be full of sadness and disappointment and maybe I'll feel helpless. And so we, we don't align our life with God's way. And, and the truth is, if we actually do a hard check, real honesty check right now, how many of you would rather be rich in the ways of the world, right, secure in the ways of the world, and also believe in the kingdom of God, versus what James says that we should do, which is revel in being in the lower status, you know, being poor in the ways of the world and trusting that it's all going to work out when God's kingdom comes in full. I know that I have a really hard time choosing the second one, being like, that sounds good. No, there's something about us that feels like, but I can control things if I have the, the resources of the ways of the world. And so I begin to rely on them. And I begin to believe in them and trust in them. But we get lulled into believing you're in control until something happens and it takes you out at the knees and you realize I'm not in control where something just dashes your hopes, your expectations, your desires. I know this was the case for my very dear friend. So one of my very good friends, I won't give his name for, you know, anonymous, anonymous sake. But anyways, he's a very, very good friend, been my friend for, you know, 20 years now. And uh, he is a planner. 
He has plans upon plans upon plans, right? So many plans. In fact, he is such a planner that when we play board games together, we have a rule for him that we set a two-minute timer, and he has to take his turn within two minutes because he will be like thinking about the end game and asking you what you have and doing this and what might you do. And you're like, just take your turn, man. None of this is eternal. None of, it doesn't matter. But for him, he's just, he's game playing it, the whole thing, right? And he does this with life. And he has plans upon plans upon plans. And he had his whole life planned out. And he was happy to let God in on his plans and inform God what his plans were. So one of his plans was to buy this really great investment property. And he was going to live in one floor, him and his family, and they were going to rent out the other two floors. And this was going to be like an investment for retirement, awesome. They bought the house and it had all sorts of damages and work, like so much work that needed to be done. The, the foundation was cracked, you know, and you're like, you, ha you can't be like, yeah, you know, just paste that together. That is a, a lot of work. They had to lift up the house, do all sorts of crazy things with it. And then his plan for setting out the rental units did not get approved. So suddenly he's like, now I have this big house with one rental unit instead of two, and cool, right? And then the housing market crashed on top of that. So now he's hundreds of thousands of dollars underwater with this investment property. And along that, right around that same time, he found this job that he's like, this is gonna be my dream job. This is a job that I want. It's great, I'm gonna take it. So he took that job, let God know that it was his dream job. I uh, took it and he hated it. It was terrible. His boss was terrible. The work was terrible. Everything about it was awful, right? And so his whole life is upside down. All of his plans dashed. But you know what? My friend has plans upon plans, so he has another plan. Short sells the house, moves across the country from Boston to California, takes his other dream job, right? Now he's in his dream job in California. It's so great. Six months later, the company goes under. And he's like, great. And so after all this time, he ends up temping at this place where, like, no room for you know, uh, upward mobility, no prospect for like actual long-term long -term work. He's making fine money, but he's just stuck. And as he's stuck, he realized he, he is so angry with God. He is so mad because God has been disappointing. All of these decisions were good and they were right. And my friend has been a follower of Jesus since he was young. He's not a secular believer who's like, I, I kind of believe in Jesus and do what I want. Like, he really wants to be faithful. And if, if you have been in one of these seasons or you have walked alongside someone in these seasons where it is just dark and they cannot see their way forward, it is very hard to watch someone you love walk through that. And my friend, as he is just stuck and he's so angry and he's so hurt. And this is years. I'm not talking like, oh, you know, he was temping for a couple weeks, got a great job, and he was done. Like years just working through this and realizing in that time that he had organized and ordered his whole life around the wrong priorities. He would made decisions based on the wrong things, and he didn't realize that he had aligned his life with the ways of the world. And he was looking for the security of the world. And as he did that, he felt entitled. He would look around and think, I'm entitled to that type of retirement. I'm entitled to that type of car, to that type of financial security. And then he would see other people as competition. Well, they're ahead of me, so I got to beat them. And he stopped asking God. He stopped relying on God for things, but he still expected God to meet his expectations. And in this season, as he stepped back and was able to see, oh, I had made friends with the world, my loyalties are not where I thought they were. It wasn't until his life just crashed around him that he realized he's not in control. He is not in control of everything that happens to him. And if he continued to live this way, it just wasn't working anymore. He was miserable. His family was miserable. And God had become the God of his worst fears the God that doesn't provide, the God that doesn't show up, the God that doesn't answer prayers, right? And, and he, in this season, he began to see, like, I created that God. I created the God of my worst fears because when he was met with Jesus, the real Jesus, he saw, oh, Jesus' plans are not my plans. Jesus' plans for my life are not what I thought they were going to be. And my expectations of what a relationship with Jesus would yield are not they're not the right ones. But you know what Jesus does want to do? He wants to set them free. He wants to set them free. But that freedom, that release, only comes with humility. Jan Meyer says it like this. God wants us, all of us. He wants everything for us, and he asks everything of us as he finds, 
restores, and leads our hearts. He asks us to leave our old ways, not just old habits, but the way we view life, the way we see. He asks us to drop our nets, to face our stories, to be misunderstood and even shamed by others, believing that the hidden reasons must be spectacular. My friend, the healing that he experienced did not, be, not happen because his circumstances shifted. In fact, you know, he got, he's been in and out of jobs for years and years and years right now. He's still now, he's like in another temporary job. And you're like, oh man. But he has been healed because his perspective shifted. Because he began to see that God does not exist to bless his plans. God does not exist for his financial security. God does not exist in order for him to have the quality of life that he believes he is entitled to. He had to embrace the great reversal that, you know what, all of that, the worldly status and the worldly wealth and the things that the world offers you, it's all going to fade away. It doesn't matter eternally. And if that's what you're investing in, you will be so sad. At the end of it, you will be so sad because you will be left with something that didn't matter. And so how do we get into this real humility, this right perspective that heals us? That sets us free. Luckily for us, James, he kind of spells it out for us. He says this, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. So he really gives us in this, we can see four steps that move us closer to this heart of God, that, get, that gets our perspective right. And the first step is to submit, to submit. And when we hear submit, it's like submit, you know, it's a bad thing. But here it's, a, it's willing, it's a willingness to yield yourself. It's a voluntary action. It means to order our lives under God's authority, to put God first and God's ways first. Jan Meyer says, obedience is an ongoing invitation to relinquish control, but God wants our release, not our destruction. And so part of submitting is recognizing and realizing you are not in control. You're not in control. You could lose your job tomorrow. It's happened to me, right? Within one day, lost everything, right? You can lose your job. You can lose the security of your family. You can lose your house. You, you can lose anything tomorrow. You do not know what tomorrow holds. You could lose your life, Jesus says. You're only guaranteed today. You are not in control. And until we start to come to terms with that and really recognize, yes, your decisions matter. They absolutely matter. But you, in the end, cannot control the world around you. It doesn't work that way. And we have to submit, willingly yield ourselves to God. And so for my friend... You know, like, this was in when he's temping, right, in this job, and he's having to realize, like, God, I have to submit my whole expectations around what a career looks like to you and what I think I deserve in that, why I want it, when he's stuck in a place that he never thought he would be, you know, with no guaranteed outcome other than the kingdom of heaven. That's the only guaranteed outcome we have is that the kingdom of heaven is good and it will set all wrongs right. And so we have to start there. Real humility is grounded in trust. And if we don't have trust, we won't get anywhere. And then that second step that James talks about is to resist. He says, resist the devil and he will flee flee from you. And some of you are like, oh man, this is weird talking about the devil, right? And you think that's, that's bizarre. But the truth is, Eugene Peterson says it, I love it. He says, the only empirical belief that we have is the reality of evil meaning it is the one thing that you can clearly see in this world. We can see the effects of evil, whether that is from natural disasters or that is from how humans are treated, from death and sickness, all of it. We can see, we can see the result of evil. And as Christians, we believe that there is a personified force behind that that has an agenda working against the good of God. And so what James says when he says resist 
It's not this epic battle where it's like, you know, there's evil behind every corner and you're never going to come get you. We see when Jesus resists evil, it, the word is to stand against. He's not, he doesn't fight demons. He just says, go away, be quiet. You know, his authority is so much higher. And so to resist isn't to battle evil. It is to stand in the goodness of God, trusting that that is greater than anything else. And James, earlier in his letter, says, flee from temptation. Run away from it. Like, you know, retreat from, from temptation. And, and what we can mean, part of resisting is recognizing the things that tempt you, that lead you away from the will of God in ordering your life in the ways of God. So for my friend, part of this resisting was fleeing. And it was fleeing from certain conversations or being in certain places that he knew was just going to make his heart bitter. And it was also taking captive every time an anger, angry or bitter thought came into his mind, giving that over to God and saying, here's a place where I just feel entitled or I feel disappointed or I feel let down and continuing to surrender to that. And so to resist the works of evil is to say, I will not allow myself to have thoughts, to be in places, to have conversations that move me out of the goodness of God. I'm going to rely on the goodness of God. And then he says to draw near, to draw near. And this is to move towards God. It is, it is a voluntary action on our part, right? We take a step towards God, but there's a promise that as soon as you step, God is ready and waiting. Like, it's almost like the, the wording that James uses, like, God's in the wings, just waiting for you to take a step, and he's going to be right there, rushing to meet you. You don't have to keep walking and walking and walking and hoping that eventually you find God. Is that God is ready to draw near. He wants to draw near. And so for my friend, drawing near looked, looked more than just reading his Bible in prayer. That was already part of his life. But for him, it meant going to counseling with a mature Christian. And he needed someone further down the road who had a different perspective to ask him the right questions, to help him see why he was so angry, to help him see where maybe his priorities were off, and also to help him find the longing to be friends with God and the ways in which he could step closer. And so sometimes drawing near means finding someone to walk alongside you, to help you figure out what that looks like, to ask you good questions. Because sometimes we can't find the way all on our own. We're not meant to do faith on our own. But it means putting God as a priority in our lives and choosing to spend time with him and choosing to be in environments where we grow closer to him. And then lastly, the last step is to repent. And if you've been around here a while, you've heard it, but we can't ever hear it too much. Repent does not mean to turn away from, right? The emphasis is not in stop doing something. Stop looking at that. Stop doing that. The emphasis is to turn towards God. And when we turn towards God, we naturally turn away from whatever it is that we were looking at. So it is to reorient ourselves. And the way that James talks about this, he says, wash your hands and purify your heart. And what he means is, you know, your hands are what you bring offerings with. And he says, the outside should match the inside. Get your inside intention right, but also then let your outward actions line up with that. And he says that this will result in mourning and weeping and wailing. And we have to ask, well, is it that we should just feel so bad and be beating ourselves up about that? But that's condemnation, and we're told there's no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. There's none. Condemnation is when we beat ourselves up because we just didn't get it right, and we are mad at ourselves, and it's all based in shame. Conviction, conviction is this recognition that if I continue to go this way, it is only going to harm me. The path that I have been walking is not in line with God's heart, and that makes us sad. It makes us sad. Jan Meyer says, when we grieve over our sin, we admit our need for the Holy Spirit's work to produce the change we cannot produce on our own. When we are disgusted with ourselves, we're just ticked that we couldn't come up with the way to do it right, to please God, to change. Our first inclination when caught in sin is to feel ashamed and humiliated rather than sad. And so when we talk about repentance, it is not to feel ashamed and humiliated. It is to feel sad. That is what James is talking about, to mourn over the harm that I have done myself and the harm that I have done others because I've gone my own way. Because aligning your heart with the ways of the world, it never works out well. And so for my friend, 
It was this recognition that if I keep going this way, it is going to wreck my family. It is going to wreck my faith. It's going to wreck my friendships. It's going to wreck my life. And to realize that he was so sad that he had gotten so off course. It was changing his attitude and his expectations. Because here's the thing about humility. It is all, it starts with trust. And it is this recognition, this right perspective of ourselves that you are not in control. You cannot fix yourself. And it is God who heals us. It is God alone. We have to rely on God to heal us. And so as we close today, I want us to do an inventory of our own heart. Because it's easy to hear this and be like, okay, good, good. I'm going to go get lunch, right? Cool. Uh, but take a moment and see what is going on in your heart. Have you been jealous and entitled? If you really step back and think, the reason why I'm so angry is I think I deserve whatever that is that I don't have and God is withholding from me because really God's role is to make me happy? Or maybe you, you have been fighting, maybe not actively fighting, but you have, you have been wishing harm on someone else. You have been wishing the demise of someone else, that something would go wrong for them because you believe mistakenly that that will make it right for you. And that you see others as competition, someone that you have to beat. Maybe you have become so self-dependent that you've stopped relying on God. You stopped asking for God for things long ago. You stopped asking God to show up in your life. You stopped asking for provision and you have just settled into, I can do it by myself. I'll take it from here, thanks. Or, or maybe you've just become selfish. And sometimes it's really hard to step back and look at and say, I've begun to believe that I'm the center of my own universe and that, that the purpose of my life is to be happy rather than the purpose of my life is to know my creator and live in the freedom that he offers me and join him in the redemption and release of all things. That's the purpose of life. That's where meaning is found. And I believe that even, even if I experience suffering in this life, the glory that the kingdom is going to bring, my hope is in the ultimate goodness that God is bringing about. And I won't, I won't put all of my self-worth and value and things that are just going to end and fade away. I'm going to have that eternal perspective. And so if you are already a follower of Jesus, maybe, maybe you need to resubmit your life to him and see that I've been trying to control things, God. I have plans on plans on plans and I'm willing to let you bless my plans. And maybe you need to step back and say, God, I don't even know if my plans are right. I don't know if my plans are your plans. I haven't even asked you what your plans are or if my plans really line up with who you are and how you are calling me to live. And we need to submit. Or maybe we need to draw near. That you actually haven't made time for God. I mean, it's summer, right? It's summer. There's so many things to do. If I'm in town, maybe I'll go to church or maybe I'll sleep in. It's summer. But you think, God doesn't take summer off, right? God is still active in your life. Faith doesn't need a summer break. And so one of the best ways to draw near to God is to be part of a community that's drawing near to God. One of, the, one of the best places to start is just consistently come to church and be around others and learn about God. That's a great, it's not an ending place, but it's a great starting place to say, when I'm here, I'm going to be here. I'm going to commit to being here. Maybe you need to resist something. Maybe you need to flee a relationship, a context, a job, you know, social media, whatever that is that you say, whatever that thing that's just bringing you into bitterness and anger that helps you look around and think, I don't have that, and that's not working for me. Or I, the more I talk about this, the angrier I get. And we need to push away from that. You know, maybe it's repentance. It's turning towards God and saying, I, you have not been my first love, and I'm sorry. And maybe, maybe you're here today, and you've never actually been friends with Jesus, right? You've never really felt like God wanted to be your friend. You felt like God was distant and, you know, to even try to take a step is just going to be too long of a journey. And I love James's words about this, that as soon as you draw near, God is rushing towards you. He is ready. It's, a, it's the, the prodigal son, right? The, the parable of the prodigal son where the father is ready and waiting. As soon as he sees the son, he runs down the road to greet him. And I want you to know that 
being friends with Jesus is one of the easiest things you can do and one of the most challenging things you can do because he is so ready to join you and do life with you, but he asks everything of you. He doesn't let you hold back parts of yourself that say, yeah, I'm yours except for with my job or yeah, I'm yours except for with my relationships or my money or my stuff. He asks all of it. But I've said this before, Jesus makes life better and makes you better at life. I wouldn't want to do life without him, right? He makes life better. It makes you better at life. And so if you haven't taken that step, but today you're feeling that nudge, or maybe you took that step a real long time ago and you've totally fallen away and you want to step back towards Jesus today, there's a prayer that I'm going to pray in just a moment. And whether you are needing to recommit, you know, you've know, you been a faithful follower of Jesus, but you realize, oh, I'm, I've been going my own way, or you you want to commit for the first time, I'm going to invite you to hear this prayer and let it be your prayer. And, and if you make that decision today, either one, you know, wherever you are, don't leave here and not tell someone. Whether you came to church with someone or you need to find someone on staff, don't let that just be like, I said that and then I went to lunch and I forgot. Let it be a moment. Let someone else hear because when you speak it out loud, it becomes real. So let's pray. Whether you need to say yes to God for the first time or say yes all over again, hear this. Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God, that you died on the cross to rescue me from sin and death and to restore me to life, life and more life. I choose now to turn from my sins, my self-centeredness, my brokenness, and every part of my life that does not please you. I choose you. I give myself to you. I receive your forgiveness and ask you to take your rightful place in my life as my Savior and Lord. Come reign in my heart. Fill me with your love and your life and help me to become a person who is truly loving, a person like you. Restore me, Jesus. Live in me. Love through me. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name I pray.